Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the PowerShell video series. In this episode we're going to do some pretty exciting stuff and finally make some scripts of our own. It's about time, isn't it? We're going to take a look at the final two pieces of the object system we haven't covered yet. The first one being this thing we saw on Add Member back in episode 3, and the second one being this thing we saw in the last episode. These are the missing pieces of the object system, and we're going to take a look at these and what they mean and all of that. But until then, let's make our first PowerShell script. Just in case you aren't aware what a script is, all it is is a file containing PowerShell code in it. And what happens is you can run the script file. And when you do that, it runs all the lines of PowerShell in there from top to bottom. That's what it is. To make a PowerShell script, we just make a file with the extension PS1. It's a weird extension, I know. And there we are, this is a PowerShell script. Now, when you run the script, it runs all the PowerShell you have in here, one line at a time from top to bottom. If you're on a Windows system, the way you normally run a PowerShell script from the File Explorer is actually not to double click on it, but rather to right click on it and do Run with PowerShell. But, since the version of PowerShell bundled with Windows is version 7, this button here runs it in version 7. But the latest version, and the one we've been using this entire time, is version 7. I can assure you that you probably won't even notice a single difference between the two. Almost every single script you write for 5 is going to work in 7. But it would be nice to always be using the latest stuff. So, the other way to run it, besides this Run with PowerShell 7 button you can enable, is to just run the script from PowerShell 7. To do that, we'll hop into PowerShell, go to the folder the script is in, and then write dot slash and the script name. This is how you run scripts in Bash, that's how most command lines go, and PowerShell is no exception. This is how you run scripts in PowerShell. However, when we go to run our incredible, completely empty script, you may find that we get an error telling us that running scripts is disabled on this system. You may not get this error, but if you do, this is actually a really useful security feature, and it's something that the regular command prompt really ought to have. You see, by default, PowerShell stops you from just running any random script you find online, which, regardless of what command line you're using, can be a very dangerous thing. So by default, it just disables it. You'll notice there's actually a link here, and if we visit that link, then it will tell you all about this blocking, and all these different modes you can get. There's all kinds of really cool security features you can get. You can actually sign scripts, so you can prove they haven't been tampered with. There's all sorts of neat stuff you can do. But for now, let's just disable it. We really don't need it. To do that, we'll just run PowerShell as an admin, and say set execution policy, unrestricted. And that should do the trick. We've now given ourselves unrestricted permission to run PowerShell scripts however we like. So, after restarting PowerShell, we can now run the script just like this. And it worked. It didn't do anything because there's nothing in the script, but it worked. So, let's write out a script. You can use whatever editor you want. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code because it actually has support for PowerShell and has all of this nice auto-completing for you. So just to check this script is really working, let's put something in it. Let's write some plain text to the console. To do that, we can use echo, which is an alias for the command write output. And this command just has one parameter, and whatever we put in this parameter is what it prints. So if I put the string hello in there and save and run the script, then it prints hello when we run the script. Great. Alright, so let's get a little creative with this. Here's what we're going to make. We're going to make a script that acts like a little calculator, like this here. I run the script, and it asks me to enter the first number. I enter the first number, then it asks me to enter the second number. And so I enter the second number, and then it shows us the two numbers added together. So this should be interesting. Let's see how we can make this script. Now, if you've never done this sort of programming before, it does take practice to get good at it. But fundamentally, it's all about breaking the script up into smaller steps. Start from the beginning. What does the script do when we first run it? It asks for the first number. So first, we need to ask for the first number. To do that, we'll just print out, please enter the first number. All right, that should do it. Then the next step is to get the user to input something, make them enter something in. And after a Google search, you'll find that we can do that 
using a command called read host. It's quite a simple command. When you run this command, PowerShell will start waiting for us to type something in and hit enter. And when we do type something in and hit enter, the command gives back what was typed in. Since I didn't actually do anything with what it gave back, it just printed it back out to me. But we can use this to get the input from the user by putting it into a variable. By putting what it gives back into a variable. Just like this. So this line runs the command, which waits for the user to enter something, and then puts whatever they entered into the first variable. Okay, that will work for now. Let's move on. And next, we do exactly the same thing, but for the second number. The second number they want to have in the calculation. And again, I'll just put what they enter into a variable called second. Okay, great. So, so far, if I run my script here, it asks for the first thing, and that first thing goes into the variable, and then it asks for the second thing, and that second thing goes into the variable. Now we just need to do the final part, where it prints this message. So, how can we do this? Well, remember what I said about breaking it down. How about we do the mass bit first, and put that into a variable, just so it's easier. So, we're going to do the first plus the second, and put that into a variable called sum. Alright, so that's the actual mass out of the way. Now let's see if we can make this message here. Now, the way you would make this message is using the double quotes writing we learnt about in the last episode. Remember, write output takes a string. So to make a message like this to print out, we just need to make a string that contains this. And we can do that with the double quotes we learnt in the last episode. Let me show you. So we're going to be writing out a message, so we'll write write output. And then the message we're going to write will be this. We'll do double quotes so we can do the substitution thing. And then inside here, we'll say what we want it to say in our message. And what we want is the first variable, and then a plus, and then the second variable, and then an equal sign, and then the sum. And there's our message. Cool. Let's try it out. So I'll run the script, and we'll see it's asking us for the first number. So I'm going to enter in 5, and for the second number, 7. And we can see that there's our message, and it did work. 5 plus 7 equals, uh, 57? Wait, that's not right. What happened here? Well, I know almost immediately what's happened. I mean, I technically do anyway, because I'm obviously reading everything off a script. But it may not be so obvious to you, as you're not familiar with this common mistake. Let's see if we can deduce what the problem is. So clearly the addition isn't working, it's giving me this strange result. I think the best way for us to investigate this result is to see if we can figure out how it got this result in the first place. Then we can likely guess at what's causing it. So, we gave it 5 and 7, and it got 57. Hmm, let's run it again and give it 3 and 10. Right, and now it got 310. I think you may be noticing a pattern here. The result we're getting is the first number joined onto the second, not added, they've been joined. That's the problem. This plus is not adding them like they're numbers, it's just joining them together. But why? Why is it doing that? Well, clearly something about this numbers must not be the way we think they are. Let's quickly check what type they are. To do this, I'm simply going to add a line here that gets the type of the first. And because I'm not doing anything with what this gives back, PowerShell will simply draw a table of the type object, which is fine, that's what we want to see. So we enter the number 5, and then as soon as we enter this number in, it's going to run this line. That will get the type, and the type isn't going anywhere, so it will get printed out. So we press enter, and... and ah, wait a second, first is a string, not an integer. And I'm going to assume the second is the same too. And the reason why it's a string, is that's what read host gives back. It takes the exact text the user entered, and gives it back. That's what it does. So what happens was because these two are string objects, when we did the plus on them to get our sum, it was joining them together, because that's what happens when you do plus on the string. So what we need to do, somehow, is to convert the string read host gave us into a number object that we can actually do maths on like a number. And we can do that with casting. We can cast it. Now, you may think that we can just write square brackets in before the read host to cast the string it gave back into an integer. But this won't quite work. There is just one more adjustment we need to make. If we try to run the script now, you'll notice it's giving me an error about read host. 
And the reason why it's doing this is, as you probably remember from the last episode, whenever we try to do something to the object a command gives back, be it run methods or access properties, PowerShell needs brackets around the command, so it's very clear what our intent is, and casting is the same. So we're quite simply going to wrap read host in brackets, and now it understands me perfectly. And now if we run it, we enter our first number, then our second number, and now the addition works as expected, because this plus was happening on actual number objects. By the way, if you want, you can actually get rid of the sum variable entirely, and just do the addition right here inside the message. If I do dollar sign followed by brackets, I can put the first plus second in here. So now it's super compact and all in one line. Great, that was a nice interesting thing, wasn't it? Well, don't worry, because in the next video, we're going to make even more complex scripts when we start to learn about control flow that allows us to make decisions and loops and such. And I'll also show you this Visual Studio code I'm using a little bit more. It's a great program. It's really, really useful for writing scripts because it has all of this nice interactive stuff. But until then, as I mentioned at the start of this video, we have these two final pieces of the object system to cover. So let's take a look at them. I'd like to start with the double colon thing, and this is the final part of the object system you actually need to know about that we haven't really explored. Now, as you know by now, every object in PowerShell has members on them, right? What members an object has is determined by its type, except some stuff like note properties that are dynamically added. And what's actually stored in those members, or what they affect, is different per object, right? For example, every file info has a name property. That's what the type says they all have. But what's stored in that name property is different for each file info object. I might have one file info object with abc.txt in the property, another with def.txt in the property, and so on. Each object has a different thing stored in them. And a similar thing goes for method. When we run a method on an object, the action it performs depends on what object we're calling it on. If I call the delete method on an object about the file abc.txt, it will delete that file abc.txt. So they can vary depending on the object you run them on too. And that's how members are. However, there are also things called static members. And unlike the regular non-static members we've been seeing, these members are shared across all objects of the same type. They aren't on the individual objects, they're on the actual type, and there's only one of them per type. We saw a static method in the last episode, the method new. This method new isn't attached to any one object, there's only one of that method if you will, and you just run it, giving it what it wants, and it makes a new object of the type it makes an object for. Static methods are kind of like commands, you just run them, giving them what they want, if anything, and they'll go off and do something and maybe give something back. And there are also static properties too. And yet again, there's only one of these properties. So if the file info type had a static property called A, then unlike a non-static property, where it has a different value per object, there would only be one of this property, and that just has whatever value it has. When I set that property to something, it stays like that for everyone. The way we access a static thing is by writing the type it's put under, and then two colons, which is what we saw, and then the name of the thing. That's how you access static things, that's what the two colons do. We can get a list of all the static members on a type, all the things that there's only one of for a type, using getMember. All you do is take a type, like datetime, and then pipe this type object into getMember with dash static on it. This dash static tells it to get us all the static members available under the type. Without this dash static, getMember is literally going to give us a list of all the members on the literal type object, which is definitely not what we want. So if we run it, you can see all the static things available on this type. So we can see that new method we were running before. There it is. So the fact that it's in this list means that I can do date time and then do two colons to access the static shared method new. But there's other stuff in here too. For example, on the date time type, there's a static property called now in here, which stores the current time right now, and obviously holds the date time. So if I do date time two colons, and then simply write now, 
it will get what's in that one shared now property, which is a date time holding the current time right now, as you can see. So that explains what the two colons are. They let us access static stuff that's filed away under the type. There are actually some types that are literally only static. For example, there's a type called environment that contains a whole bunch of static stuff. You can't actually make an object of this type. I can't make an environment type of object. It's literally just a type designed to have a whole bunch of static stuff on it telling us about well, the environment. Alright, so with static done, there's only one other thing I'd like to cover in this episode, and that's this at sign followed by curly braces. We first saw this all the way back in episode 3, in the command add member. It's been a while. As you hopefully remember, add member lets us mainly add note properties, and the best way to do that is to pipe in the object we want to add the note property to, and then write dash note property members, followed by this thing here where we have the new property name and what we want to have in it. So what is this thing? Well, when you think about it, this looks very similar to something we saw in the last episode. In the last episode, we learned how to make arrays, and we did that like so. And this is almost the same, but it has curly braces instead of rounded brackets. And the reason why these two are very similar is both of these create what we call collection. In fact, there's a type called iCollection that both of these will cast to. Collections are things made up of many smaller objects. The first one makes an array, which is a type of collection we can get, the one we learned about in the last episode. And the second one creates a hash table, and a hash table is also a collection of smaller objects. But in a hash table, instead of having a number as an index, like in an array where you select a certain object by the position, we instead have an object as an index. Every item has a key alongside it, and that key is how we get that item. For example, let's say we wanted to store a bunch of people's ages in a variable, and we want to be able to quickly get the age of someone from their name not from their position in the variable, from their name. What we would do is we'd put a hash table in the variable, and we'd make the key, as it's known, be the person's name, and then make the value, the thing that goes alongside that key, their age. So it would look like this. We have the name of each person in the key, and the age of each person in the value. And then what we can do, is if I want to find out the age of a certain person by their name, we can write square brackets, and put their name in those square brackets. And that's what they do. They basically let us use our own key as an index. So essentially, with an array, you can get a smaller value based on its position. With a hash table, you get a value not by its position, but by the key you have attached to it. Anyway, the way you make a hash table is by writing this. For each item, you write the key, followed by an equal sign, and then the value. And if we want to put multiple items in the hash table, we can separate them with semicolons like this. So here's a hash table with two items, an Alex with the age of 500, and a Mike with the age of 25. So the hash table would look like this, and I could ask for the value that goes alongside Alex, or I could ask for the value that goes alongside Mike. Now, the command add member isn't actually interested at all in using our key as an index. What add member does is it literally just goes through each thing in the hash table and for each thing adds a new property, using the key as what name to give it and the value as what to put into the property. That's how add member uses the hash table. It literally just goes through each thing and uses its key and its value as the name and value. So, Let's hop into PowerShell and play about with these hash tables. So, here's a hash table as I described earlier, and if I print it out, we can see that it's got a key and a value for each item. And if I want to access the value that goes alongside the Alex here, I simply write square brackets and put the string Alex in. It's a string because this key here is a string. And it gives me the 500 that goes with that. So we're using the keys as the index. If you want to add an item to a hash table, you can't use plus. It would be quite awkward trying to communicate both the key and value with that anyway. But there is a method on it called add, that takes in two parameters, the key and the value. 
The object type means it can take in anything. We can technically put whatever we want as the key and the value. So we can use that to add to it. That's how you'd add to it using this. One thing you need to be aware of when it comes to hash tables is they aren't as well recognized as arrays. And what I mean by that is things like for each or even things like measure from the first episode don't work very well with hash tables. For example, if I make an array with three things in it and then pipe that to measure, it will tell me correctly that there's three things in that array. That's what measure actually does. It takes in arrays and measures details about them. That's what we've been doing the entire time. However, if we give it a hash table with two items in it, measure is going to say there's only one, which is wrong. There's two items in my hash table. And the reason why measure says there's only one is it's not recognizing that the hash table is a collection. All measure is seeing is this one single hash table object, not the smaller things inside it. And that's why it says there's only one of them. Similarly, for each doesn't recognize it either. It just sees it as one object. You can get around these though by calling a method called get enumerator on the hash table and then piping the result of that to these. And now it works. It's pretty unintuitive, I know, but yeah, generally they're not very well recognized. Anyway, I've been saving the best bit of hash tables for last. There is one very cool thing we can do with hash table. When we have a hash table, we can use it to create a brand new, completely custom object with our own properties in it. You see, PowerShell has a really cool feature where if you cast a hash table into a PS custom object, it makes a brand new object and goes through all the things in the hash table and turns them into properties in said object. Here's a hash table with two items in it, an A and a B. And if I cast this to PS custom object, it will create a new object that, if we look at it, has an A and a B property on it. Well, actually, to be exact, it has an A and a B note property on it. It's actually made these note properties. Remember what I said before about how regular properties can't just appear. But yeah, it's a very cool and very convenient way to super quickly make a brand new object with whatever properties you want. All right, we're nearing the end of the video. Now, I had so much fun writing that script earlier. I think we should write another script, but step it up a notch this time. Just before we do that, however, there's one more thing I'd like to mention that we haven't actually talked about yet. In PowerShell, it's possible to put multiple lines inside a certain thing. For example, here we are in a script, and I've got this array with 1, 2, and 3 in it. And I want to then pipe the array over to for each. Now, what if I want to do more than one thing in this for each? What if I want to run loads of different lines of PowerShell per each object? Well, to do that, what we can do is put multiple lines in these curly braces, like this. And on each line, I can tell it what I want it to do. So let's say I want it to, I don't know, print the message A, and then print the message B as well. Well, I can do it like this. What this is going to do is each time the for each goes through an item, it's going to run both of these lines, this line and this line. By the way, you'll notice that we've got a bunch of spaces before it now. This is actually a very, very common practice when you enter inside curly braces. It's not necessary. We don't have to do this. I could just put these back here and it would still work. But it's just a neatness thing to have things inside curly braces pushed forward. And I'll talk more about this in the next episode. It's a really nice way to keep things neat. Now, some programming languages want you to put semicolons at the end of lines. And you can actually do that in PowerShell as well if you'd like, but you don't need them and they won't actually do anything different if you do have them there. One thing they are useful for though is letting you put multiple lines of PowerShell all together in one like this. I took the two prints and put them together with the semicolon. When PowerShell reads this, it sees one line here and runs that. And then the semicolon marks the end of that line. And then we've got another line here which sometimes you might want, although usually it's neater to keep these things on their own line. This is identical to having them both on their own lines. It's really not very common you want to put things on the same line, but if you do, you can do it with semicolons. 
Anyway, full reach isn't the only thing that you can spread out across multiple lines. It can happen in other places too. You can also create a raise across multiple lines like this. And in fact, when you spread this out across multiple lines, you don't even need the commas after each item, you can just go without them. And you can also spread hash tables out across multiple lines. And when you do that, yet again, you don't need the semicolon between each thing. They will go on their own line. By the way, this doesn't just apply to script. You can also do these in the console as well. If I write for each here, and don't put the closing curly brace, it will hop down onto the next line. So I can go ahead and echo A. And if I press enter again, it will let me put in another line. So I'll echo B. And you'll notice it will keep on letting me put lines in until I write the closing curly brace. And there we are. Amazing. So you can do multi-line things in the console too by just not finishing them. It's not just scripts. Alright, let's write a script, shall we? This one will be quite interesting. What we're gonna do is make a script like this. You run it and it gives you a list of all the files in the current folder but with a line count alongside them telling you how many lines each one has. So let's do this. So the very first thing we're going to want to do is get a list of all the files in the current folder. So there we are, done. They're now in this variable. Alright, so we have the files, now what do we do next? It might be quite overwhelming to try and figure it out because this is quite a big task, but I'll run you through how I often think things through. All we need to do is just start with the first thing that comes to mind. What is the first thing the final script is doing that we're not? What's the first thing we notice? Well, we have an extra property here. So clearly we're going to need to add this property to the files at some point, right? So let's start with that. Let's start by adding this property to each of the file objects. That sounds like a good place to start. So how can we do that? Well, I think the easiest way will be to have a for each going through each file ls gave me and on each one will run add member to add this line count property to each one. So we're going to take the current object, pipe it into add member and then write dash note property members with a hash table so we can choose what members to add and we're going to add a property called line count with the value of uh Hmm, well we don't actually know how we're going to get that yet, so let's just leave that as zero. We'll figure that out next, that will be the next thing to look at, getting the right value in there. Hopefully you can sort of see how we're starting to build up the script step by step. It does take a lot of practice to get very good at this, it's a little tricky if you've never done programming before, but it is something you'll get better at doing with practice. Alright, so let's see what it does so far, just so we can see our progress. We're going to print out all the files in this variable. So, we'll run our script and it just lists out the files. Where's my property? I added the line count property, where is it? Well, it actually is there, the table view just isn't showing it. You might remember that back from episode 3, the table isn't showing it by default. But we can tell the table view to show it by taking the files and specifically piping them to the command format table and in the property parameter we're gonna tell it that I want to see the name and the line count properties included in that table. Just like this. And now if we run it, there we are. The table is showing us each file and the line count property we've added to each one, which right now is just zero. So now we need to fill that in. Now, whatever it is we're going to do to fill this in, I suspect it's probably not going to fit very nicely onto this one line. So let's make the for each multi-line like this. So the for each now spreads across multiple lines, just so we have some room to actually think here. So how do we get the number of lines on the current file. Well, you could just search on Google, PowerShell, get number of lines in file, and someone's probably already given an answer to exactly this already. But, let's see if we can figure out a way more or less by ourselves. So, hmm, if we want to get how many lines are in the current file, I suppose the first way that comes to my mind is perhaps there's a way we can get an array of all the lines in the file, right? an array where each item is a line. Because then, if we have an array like that, we could get the length of it, and there's our line count. So I'm wondering, is there a command that will get us an array of all the lines in a file? Well, let's search that on Google. PowerShell, get array of lines in file. Okay, we got some results right here. 
We could go to the first one, but I noticed on the third result, it's telling us about a command in the official documentation. How about we check out the official documentation first, and if it's not what we want, then we'll go to this first one. Okay, so it's telling us about a command called get content, and here are all the parameters on it, of course, and if we scroll down, we can find a description here. Here we are, so, it says, it gets us the contents of the item at the location, such as the text in the file. Okay, that's good. That is what we're after. We are trying to get the contents of the file, so that is a good start. But then just after, it says for files, the content is read one line at a time and returns a collection of objects. That sounds perfect. Remember, an array is a collection, it's a type of collection. So this is basically more or less saying it's going to give back an array, or something similar to an array at least, that's got one line in each item. So this command sounds like it could definitely be what we want. So to recap what we've got so far, we're trying to get a number telling us how many lines are in a file. And my idea on how we could do that is for us to get an array of all the lines in the file, and then grab the length of that array, and that's how we can know how many lines there are. Let's quickly check this command out in PowerShell. Here I have a CSV file with a bunch of lines in it. So let's run get content on this CSV file and check what it gives back. So if you looked at the documentation, you'd see that we simply run it and give it the path to the file. It's pretty simple to use. And I just want to quickly check what this is giving me back. So I'll take this command, put it in brackets, and get the type of what it gave back. And we see that yes, it is indeed giving back an array. How many items does this array have in it? Well, we can find out just by writing length after like this. Ah, there's 101 items. And the file is 101 lines long. Okay, so this works. We run the command get content to get an array of all the lines in the file, and then run length on that to get how many lines there are. Let's put this into the script then. So for each file, I want to get the current file's content and get the length of that to get how many lines each file has. And let's just put that into a variable. Okay, so so far, we're getting all the lines in the file, getting how many of them there are, and putting that number, that integer of how many there are, into this variable. And then on the next line, we add the line count property, and right now we're just putting zero into it. But what we actually want to put into this property is this length, this number of lines, which we put into the variable. So. Instead of putting zero into our new property, I'll put what's in the variable. And I think that's it. There's our script. So pause the video, read through it, make sure you understand what it's doing, and then we're going to run it. And if we run it, there's a list of all the files in the current folder and a count of the number of lines attached to them. Amazing. And feel free to copy and paste this into a script yourself and play about with it. Just tweak it, mess around with it, see what you can make it do. There's so many things you could do. It's all about just breaking it down into the smaller steps. Anyway, this video is dragging on insanely long. I hope you enjoyed this mega episode. I guess that's what happens when we start doing more practical things. Things are slowly drawing to an end now. I'll talk more about that in the next episode though, because this episode is far too long for me to say anything more. Bye.